So I titled this first installment, As Some People Do. And you're going to find these are some words in uh, the King James Version, a verse of Scripture, and we'll get to that uh, in just a minute. So when I was a child, I want you to understand something. I really loved the neighborhood that I grew up in. Uh, and I didn't realize how privileged we were living where we were living because I was too small to have that type of understanding. But this neighborhood that we lived in offered a level of convenience to those in that community. And so it meant that we didn't have to travel very far to find the necessary services that our household needed. Those things were in walking distance of my house. You didn't have to get in a car and drive 10 miles down the road or go across town to shop or, or to get groceries. or things. All these things were characteristic of our neighborhood. Then I looked up, because we lived at 811 Main Street, and that term in itself uh, predicts what that neighborhood has to offer, Main Street. Main Street historically uh, 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 denotes that primary retail uh, street or, of a village or, or a town or an area where everybody can kind of come and, you know, get the necessary things that they need. I, what I don't have represented here is that five and ten cent store. What was that thing called? No, it wasn't Woolworths. It was another one. Yeah, it, yeah, whatever that is, y'all just said, okay? <laughs> but it, we, we, and I'm, I'm going to go through some of the things that, that we had. And when I looked at this definition, I said, that's the street we lived on. So living on Main Street, and I have some of the things that were there, uh, we, you know, it was basically a residential area. So there were homes, and our house was on Main Street, praise God, 811. I remember a house being next door to us, and there were several houses across the street before change came, and then, you know, the, the uh, other things were uh, established. But growing up on Main Street, we had a house. My church, Brayton United Methodist Church, was three doors down from my house. Praise God. Uh, I don't remember a beauty shop, but he put that up here anyway. We had doctor's office. You know where the doctor's office was? It was in the basement. Of East, of, of, of East National Baptist Church. Because Reverend Rucker, if that was his name, Rucks or Rucker? Rucker. He was, a, he was a, a, a physician. So we had a local doctor's office two blocks up the street. We had a dentist. I remember going when I had some, you know, my wisdom teeth were trying to come in and all that stuff. And it was a house, but it was converted to his office. You remember that dentist's name? Bright? Praise God. Whatever she said. All right? Praise God. <laughs> now, this thing about, I'll just do that because I can't hear you like I used to. We had a grocery store. Now, this was interesting about the grocery store. Uh, I guess that happened when our Uncle Joe lived in the house we were living in. But next door to us was H.G. Uh, Hill store. And it later became a, a thrift store or a antique shop or something. But right across the street, praise God, was uh, Griggs dr grocery store. And just a block uh, west of us, on the same street next to my church, was Pike's Grocery. Three grocery stores in one block. So we could go there, we could go there, we could go over there. And what I loved about it, because you could go into uh, Pike's Grocery, we were just there to buy, what, penny candy and stuff. And Mr. Pike would say, well, tell your mother uh, I got that roast in that she wanted. They knew us. We knew them. They knew everybody, and if you didn't have cash, you could buy it on time. And they had a little running tab, and when you got paid, your parents go down and pay the grocery bill. <laughs> El Harrison, you, could get, you don't even eat bologna. You could get 10 cents worth of bologna. They pull out that little stalk and run it through that little thing and wrap it up in that white paper. Then they would bag groceries, and you would see people walking home from the grocery store. With gro Try to walk home from Kroger. <laughs> Up the street, uh, about two or three blocks, we had a drugstore, Burley, and it, uh, he had a fountain shop in the drugstore. So, you know... Um, 
Uh, you walk in and he said, how's your dad? And things like that. And on, one thing I really loved on Sunday nights, uh, and this is, I don't know if we were watching Ed Sullivan or something like that. We didn't have one TV. One. I have 11 in my house. My granddaughter came up to me and said, Pop, Pop, you know I'm in the TV show. I said, no. I, she said, you have 11 televisions. We had one. So, and then you couldn't sit at a distance and change the station. You had to get up and go crank the thing. And then you have a three stations, right? Remember that? <laughs> had rabbit ears on it, remember that? To adjust it to get the picture just right? So on Sunday evenings, after church, after dinner, praise God, and we're just sitting there, we're watching something on TV, some type of variety show. Mom and Dad would get up, go to the phone, our phone number was Alpine 30133. Andrews 30133. Okay, praise God. All right. And they would call the drugstore. And the people at the fountain shop, they, you give them an order. And they would uh, buy a paint, a paint or a quart, I should say, of vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream or fudge ripple. Is that what it was called? That's the vanilla ice cream with the fudge that runs through it. And that stuff I absolutely hated that my daddy loved was butter pecan. I like it now, but I didn't like it back then. They would put that ice cream in a little container, a little cylinder, and the guy had a little bicycle, and he would drive to your house. And in a matter of 10 minutes, he's knocking on your front door, delivering ice cream. That's the neighborhood I grew up in. Across the street, we had a, a, a mattress factory. I don't know the name of it, but they made mattresses. Capital mattress factory. That's why you're up here today, old hair. Capital. Uh, we had a dry cleaners. Next school, the school I went to, that I went to from first grade to the 12th grade, was less than t two and a half blocks from my house. We walk out the back door, go down the alley, make a right turn on, what's that, Ramsey? Ramsey, and then the school was right there. One school. So that meant we knew all the teachers. All the teachers knew us. This is what I liked about the community that we lived in. The people you saw in school was the people you went to church with. And the people you went to church with are the people that you would end up in a, at the barbershop with or in the grocery store. Community. And it was convenient. And we liked it. We loved it. Then came this thing called change. And we call it a progression or being progressive or, you know, because that couldn't sustain itself, I think, but... I think somewhere in the process of progression, we need to hold fast to the principal things that make us what we are. Yes, yes, yes. And sometimes we get so anxious about change, we let too much go. Yes. Some things we should hold on to. And if you hold on to those things, it doesn't matter how the things around you change, you still got a principal base functioning and protecting you in your life. So when change came, praise God, uh, the grocery stores, where's my grocery store? The grocery stores, praise God, what you used to have, they disappeared. And now with the grocery store, what you have now are those neighborhood uh, conglomerates. Uh, they're out in the suburbs. Can't walk to the store anymore. You got to get in your car. And I remember when we moved up on Lytton Avenue, my mother and I, Carrie, would go grocery shopping. When was it, on Thursdays? Fridays, all right. Praise God. And they go and they load up the groceries and bring them back. But I also remember the days when they would walk. Remember when we lived on Lytton and there was a little grocery store? And mom would get off the bus coming home from work, go in that little local grocery store, buy whatever she was going to purchase for dinner that night or maybe the next day, and she would walk home with the groceries. You couldn't walk to Kroger. You needed transportation. My mother didn't know how to drive. So it wasn't convenient for her, for the grocery store, that local grocery store, to go out of business. Then we have these schools. What used to be, what used to service us, praise God, 
the whole community from kindergarten to is a magnet school now. So that means that people come from across town to uh, be trained in what this school is, that particular discipline this school is offering. So you don't see the locals in the local building anymore. The locals are all being bussed out somewhere else. All right? Praise God. Then you have, well, the, uh, well now the factory's gone, barbershop is gone, drugstore is gone. That means the little soda shop is gone. <laughs> what else is gone? I don't think the restaurant was ever there. The liquor store is still there. <laughs> Doctor's office gone. <laughs> Dentist office is gone. <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> the house we grew up in, it's gone. The church is still there. Beauty shop is gone. Wine liquor. The laundry is gone. Dry cleaners is gone. Factory. Something else in that building there. I don't know what it is. Is it a storage place? Praise God. You just drive down Main Street. You see condos going up, but you won't see the convenience that the community used to offer. Everybody is mobile. So I know one thing is that the enemy has a strategy. And his strategy is to divide, to conquer. And if we don't understand that, he comes up with schemes and we just jump on these bandwagons and we think we're what? Progressing or moving forward in Christ. But you've got to look back and see what are we losing in the process? And some of these things we need to bring with us. And you can't tell me that God did not know we would come to this time. So now if you still see some houses there, but, and the church is there, but the church is empty. You know what happens to churches? The local churches or used to be the ones in the community, because we had five we had one behind us, which was a Church of Christ. Braden United Methodist was right there. East Nashville, uh, First Baptist East Nashville was about four blocks that way. We had Payne Chapel, which was about two blocks behind us. We had Old Sanctified Church that was down there on South North 8th Street. Somewhere, what's that street I carry used to live on? Foster. That, that, that way, you had convenience. These people... Only ones that drove to church, listen to this, were the ones who lived in the neighborhood at some time, moved across town, but are still connected to the church. So they would drive to get to church. Everybody else walked to church. One of the best thing, uh, uh, memories that I have is seeing Reverend Griffin. He lived, his parsonage was probably three to four blocks, I would say, east of our house. On Sunday mornings, you would see him walk past our house on his way to church. You would see it in the uh, uh, in the middle of the week sometimes, or whatever appointments he had. You don't see preachers walking to church. They can't even walk across the parking lot. <laughs> it's because the parking lots are so huge. And so what, is, what happened to the local church, they, they started, what, closing down, and now we got these mega facilities and there's nothing wrong with them if you are being, if you're in community. But now you can come and you can hide. Nobody is impacting you. Nobody is in a relationship. You can just say, I went to church. Then you're getting into what Chip ministered on a couple of, uh, uh, was that last Sunday? And we got all this religious behavior, but we ain't get nothing out of coming here. We just do whatever, what we think others expect us to do. And we, we give our Sunday morning obligation because grandmama wants you to go to church or daddy or mama, whatever, this is where I have to be. But your heart really isn't in it. Like what you said, Jake's ministry. Uh, we've lost a fervor. And here in the word, God is saying, don't forsake the assembly. And even the more so, when you see these last days approaching. So in scripture, he's given us an antidote for falling away. 
And the antidote is church. Assembly. We're sitting home now. It's too inconvenient. Ah, oh, I'm tired. Oh, got to drive. That traffic, Lord Jesus. Oh, the devil will give you any excuse you need to keep you out of the body. Because when he shows up, see, he, can, he don't have any control over what goes on in here. But if he can separate you, like he, can, he devoured this community, and these people are scattered every which way, and it's the same thing that he does in the church. Because it says a house divided against itself, it won't stand. So now you're sitting there, well, I got a little, 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 little exam, a little test for you at the end of this, but you have to ask yourself this question. Do I really like church? Do I like coming to church? Do I like what church has to offer? If I had a, a choice of not going to work or not going to church, which one would I take? Uh, well, I got to pay my bills. Gotta do this. So, you know, you see, church always is that optional thing that gets tossed up or tossed aside or what have you. So we have to re identify the importance of this vehicle God has given us so that we can get out of here safely. So you have to ask yourself where is church in my mindset? Do I want to be here? And when, when I am here, am I contributing or I'm just picking out everything that's wrong? All right. Let me, let me see what's going on here now. Okay. Now, I've given you all my whole sermon. I've got about eight pages here. Let me go back. There's a profound blessing in community. In this neighborhood, before I tore it up, we had an accountability structure. My neighbor disciplined us. The teachers disciplined us. Because everybody knew everybody. And so it wasn't just what you did in your household. There was something about community. The community is that it's, it's a gathering of people of like beliefs. So that's what you have in church. You're all here because you believe God is God. Jesus is Lord. The Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit of God. At least we, we, we have something in common. And so if I come to your house after church, I expect a Christian atmosphere. If you come to mine, would you expect the same thing? A Christ I don't expect to see your wife in the corner with a bandage over her eye because you don't beat her up. That's, what is that? That's not the community we come from. So, praise God, community. In this community, we had convenience. If you had an issue, I remember the doctor would come to your house. The pastor was available. Smaller congregation, but you didn't have to walk that far to get to him. Try to get an appointment. You know, you got 20 people ahead of you, and we're trying to fit you in. Because you're, I'm just telling you what this mega has done to the church, all right? So we're not as accessible. So what we end up having to do, we have to employ uh, 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 pastoral staffs and other elders and things like that just so that we can at least touch you with the right hands, all right? But if all we're doing is hoarding or herding people in, I should say, and pushing them out, because I was in a service like that, uh, and you have, were in a waiting room waiting to get in the sanctuary for this 20 minutes that they were going to give you, and they herded you out, and then herded the next group in 20 minutes, but in each one of them things, everybody, they were just making certain they can get the offerings done. That's how it felt. You felt like cattle. You know, like being at Disney World? You get your turn on the little short ride, and then you're off. And all you're thinking about is all this money you done paid to get in here. If I want to ride this thing 10 times, I shouldn't have to stand in a, a three hours worth of line. That's what church feels like sometimes. So what is God saying that we need to do? Praise God. So the neighborhood, the grocery stores, the magnet schools, uh, uh, the drug stores, all those things have changed into something else, and we've lost the convenience. So I'm saying this is because in a setting like this, the person sitting next to you has something to offer. 
But if you don't show up, you don't get what they have to offer. And if they see that you look a little, what, well, what's going on, brother? How are you feeling? Uh, we're supposed to hold each other accountable. And we're supposed to exhort one another daily. And that exhortation, praise God, is done with urgency. Look, you got to hang on in there. So that's why you need community. There's somebody who is honestly, honestly in love with you and cares for your welfare. You're not just a number in God's church. Now, those other things, you could be just a number. But you cannot forsake this assembly. What comes across as pulpit is for you. Now, I'm saying this, God is preparing us to exit this world. He's trying to get you ready to get out of here. So there's some stuff that we got to lop off. And we got to get our mindset set back to the house of God and start running to everything else. Because there's a lot of out there. We got a lot of options. But, I, I, you know, you say you won't come to church because the weather's too cold. But you will sit in a football game at sub to zero weather. Or rain or heat. Because that's the thing to do, praise God. Hallelujah. I will say it's just, just too far, you know. But, you know, you will go whatever distance you I know people who shop all the time. I don't care where the mall is. They go. And they go more than once a week. And now God is just requiring you, because you know, to, to be here on Sundays or on a Wednesday. And it's too inconvenient. But you drive past a mall to get here, you'll stop at the mall, and that, that's more important than, than church. Praise God. See, the issue is heart. Heart is the issue. What do you really love? And we, we heard the songs and the choir and all of this that came forth, and that worship is adoration for someone you love. And if worship isn't what it should be coming from you, you have a heart issue. Towards God, not me. And you say you can do it at home, you can do it this, but he said don't forsake the assembly. You don't know better than he does. He says show up and show up frequently. Get here. There's safety in these numbers. Amen. Praise God. It's a heart issue. Bless the Lord. Now, one of Satan's most prolific schemes launched against the church is to divide and conquer. And however he chooses to do it, praise God. And sometimes we, we, we don't see it the way that we should see it. But you have to be able, and this is what you get in church and in relationship with God. And when you're in a presence that has been prepared for his his anointing. And because there are certain things, like, like I have a pastoral anointing. There are certain things that you'll only get from me are those that have that anointing on them. If you're part of this house, then you're part of what the, the, the heartbeat that God has for you. And so you need to be here to hear it. I don't care how many conferences you go to. And I don't care how celebrated they are. And how you go, oh, whoo, he, uh, all of that. But you still need what God says is coming out of this house. That's just a given. Praise God. All right? So in 1 Timothy, listen to what it says here. Uh, this is fourth chapter, first verse. I don't know where I'm saying. I'm just uh, four and one. So, uh, and I, I got this in, the, uh, in uh, uh, the New Living Translation. What does it say? Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will fall away from the truth. They will, fo fellow, uh, 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 they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Now, the apostasy of this age should not be a surprise to us. Because God has warned us that it's coming. And when we see the signs, and whether the signs are natural, Alaska just had an earthquake. Earthquake was 30 miles beneath them. Praise God. And it did the damage that it did. 
And it, the scripture talks about signs and wonders and things happening. But there's some other signs that we don't seem to be cognizant of. And we need to understand what it is God has ta- all told us to look to. So the apostasy of this age shouldn't surprise us. It is expressed something God has expressed in scripture to prepare us to help us survive the age, the times we're living in. So he says, hear me, I got this. When he was talking to Peter, you know, and he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he says, what? Will not prevail. So where's your safe place? It's in the church. Earthquake proof. Famine proof. Disease proof. Okay, what the devil comes up with? I don't care how he attacks, what's going on. If you're in community, in the house of God, if you're in church, the gates of hell don't prevail against this. So you think you can run out there and do this thing by yourself on your own, pillow to post and not accountable to anybody? You're the one the devil is after. Amen. And I'm going to show you how, how he comes for us too. All right? Praise God. Then in Matthew, the 12th chapter and the, fifth, uh, uh, the 25th verse, it could be, because sometimes when we, se- we separate ourselves, it can be blatant, just backsliding. Or, praise God, it can be cleverly devised through schemes of the enemy to divide, enemy to divide and conquer. And this is why we need discernment. Discernment helps us. And you can be a little slow to discern. But Elder Jerome and Sister Janet and Elder Harold, Elder Brian, and praise God, Elder Barry, all of these, they help us see. If you had been here in the revival, you would have heard. I mean, from Kayla to uh, Regine to Leah to Janet. Demetrius, yes. Stephanie, Stephanie, and Hackett, that was her name. Right. It was something to behold. Yes. It was a word for this yes. house. Yes. Question, how many of you heard every word that was intended for this house? Oh, I'll get the tape. Well, if you got it, have you listened to it yet? Because it's like taking class. I I was a teacher. I was a teacher for years. I I know where we're going. At the end of this, that's where you're supposed to be. And all these assignments are preparation. They prepare you for that test. Now you hear a test and you haven't done any of your homework. But if you had just taken it when God gave it. If you what, received it and allowed him to build you up in the Holy Ghost. When you got to the test. The gates of hell don't prevail against you because you're prepared. So you can't just take this lightly. Oh, well, who's preaching today? It doesn't matter who's preaching. You need what's coming over this pulpit. You need to hear the anointed voice of whoever God has assigned to stand here today. We're not asking you to come here every day. And when you come, we don't keep you all day. But this has to become a priority to you. You have to understand the importance of why God says, forsake not the assembly. Amen? So in Matthew 12 and 25, it says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, the devil's division is subdivision. You know, he just likes to do whatever he can to to pull us apart. And once he can get us separated, he tries to isolate you. Now you're out there by yourself, or you're out there with like voices, and then the enemy's sitting back, and it ain't no big deal for him now to pick and choose who he's going to pick off. He knows exactly who he's going after. Amen? Then the Father warns us to be sober and to be vigilant because the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is seeking whom he may devour. So what you need to do... It's rough out there. We actually live in a predatory world. The devil comes in many forms, shapes, and sizes. 
big, small, fat, skin, it don't matter. He's out there, he's doing what he does. That's the environment we live in. And we're supposed to be armored up. We're supposed to be prepared so we can, what, discern the schemes of the enemy. Understand where he's coming from and what he's doing. And you look at what it sounds good, but let me look past this and see where this is going to take me. And allow God to give you some insight on if you take this path, where you will end up. Praise God. We're safe in here. If you will listen to what he has to say. God has given us the means, and then the means is the church itself. So in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and the 25th verse, it says to, uh, not to neglect our meeting together as some people do. That's why I titled this, as some people do. As some people do. Say, as some people do. As some people do. Do you? Say it again. As some people do. As some people do. Do you? I said to your neighbor, as some people do, do you? Oh, it's inventory time. We got to see. Oh, yeah. I ain't been to church in four weeks. Wow. Mm, Okay. All right. As some people do. So the antidote to end time division, praise God, is end time assembly. Make certain you find yourself in the assembly so you can hear the rest of what God has to say. Amen. I think we underestimate the power of your local assembly. We underestimate it. We think it's not necessary. It's vital. Vital. I said uh, earlier, I said I love church. And I, even though I, I, I love being on vacation with my wife, I love being away and sharing, and that, but I miss church. I'm thinking about what's going on at the church. What do they do? Who preached today? See what I'm saying? Praise God. Hebrews, the third chapter, the 12th through the 14th verse. It says, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be heartened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are what? Made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Exhort daily. Exhort daily. Amen. Now, I know you can call each other girl. But what comes out of your mouth after girl? Are you exhorting one another? Are you just going down that gossip right? Did you hear? Have you heard? What? That's not helping anybody. Amen? Praise God. In community, like I said, we hold each other accountable. Praise God. So when we get over to 2 Timothy, the third chapter and the first verse, this is what he says. He says, this know also that in the last days perilous times will come. And what shall we be able, uh, what should we be watching for? What behavior indicates the perilous times are present? Well, he goes, Paul goes on and he tells Timothy what to look for. And one of them is, he's, is self-love, all right? And instead of Christian charity, now we're concerned more about ourselves than anybody else. And so we, 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 we've turned this thing towards us. I want you to say, as some do. As some do. Do you? Christian charity. Is it hard for me to be charitable, to be a blessing to somebody else, to pinch off of what I have, even if it's a little, and as God leads to be a blessing to somebody else? Or is it always, always only about me? I have much and I want more. I'm not willing to share what I have. That's the sign of the last days he's talking about. Amen? Praise God. Is that you? Then he talks about covetousness in that same verse. It's only natural for those, praise God, who love themselves to become covetous. (laughs) Because I want what you got. I want one of those. I want one of this. So we should ask ourselves, as some do, is that you? Is that you? Praise God. Then we look at pride and vain glory. When men no longer fear God, they worship themselves, praise God. And even 
have less regard for their fellow man. Yeah. When God is not in right perspective, you don't see people right. That's right. You only see what it is you're not getting, praise God. So you need to ask yourselves, as some do, is that me? Is that me? Signs of the last days. I'm telling you, you need church. Praise God. Unthankful. When you are unthankful for God's blessings, did you know that you become even unthankful for his mercies? You don't even know how blessed you are. You can't even identify how merciful he has been. And you're just bold in your mess and your stuff. Just, you know, all of that's coming to an end. And the, 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 the deceiving thing about it, sometimes it's a slow end. See, it doesn't happen right then. You're, you're, you're gradually degrading. And you don't even know that you've been cooked. And when you finally get to that place, how did I get here? Step by step. Praise God. Without natural affections, ask yourselves, as some do, are you without natural affections? See, these are things that you're supposed to possess just as a human. And now we got all this unnatural stuff. And we find out, says, well, okay, you know, they bombarded us with it. And now, you know, rules, laws are changing to make concessions and all of that. And, oh, it's just easier to go with the flow. So we're making room for it. But where are we making room for it? We're making room for it in our own existence. And something's supposed to be encouraging you to stand against this stuff. Right. The world's going to do what the world does. And I'm not sure, who do you want to identify with, the world or with God? It's just easier to identify with the world. And before you know it, you're saying some of everything, you're doing some of everything, and ain't nobody what correcting you because they're all doing it. You can't even hear the Holy Spirit say, mm-mm. And some, as some do, praise God. Then you got truth breakers, as some do. Is that you? You got disobedient children, as some do. Is that you? I want, I want to say this to young folk. I know it's difficult. You have ideas and aspirations and things that you think. But when you're in your parents' house, and if you're of a certain age, and this really should extend beyond whether you're grown or not. There's, scripturally, there's a place of honor and respect you're supposed to give your parents whether you like them or not. Whether you think they're stupid or smart. <laughs> that doesn't erase the, uh, the fact that God wants you to honor your parents. And you can sit down and say, Dad, Dad Mom, I, I just have problems with what you're asking me to do. But since I'm your child, I'm going to honor it in your house, El Harris said. I'm going to honor the, that. And one day when this frontal lobe thing clicks in like it should, you begin to see the wisdom that they were offering. And this lets you know you're immature because when they're giving it to you back then, you weren't mature enough to receive it. You didn't understand how important it was. You're willing to trash all of it. And then walk off and do your own mistakes. Then you learn those same lessons they were trying to instill into you. But now you learn them through hardship. As opposed to saying, well, okay, I'll try this. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Uh, truth breakers, as some do. Is that you? Disobedient children, as some do. Is that you? Lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, as some do. Is that you? Having a form of godliness. Oh, you should have heard what your priest said a couple of Sundays ago. You know, we, we got the mannerisms down. Oh, you, you hit the right beat over there. Oh, I give you the right step. You know, it's just, uh, and we have to respond. And this is something you're going to have to check yourself at the end of this message because I, I'm going to require or ask you to do something. But you're going to have to respond from a pure place, not that rehearsed place. See, to show the world that I'm spiritual. 
You know, I know how to be slain. You know, you don't just go down, you got to. See, we got all that down, pat, down, pat. It just, just looks like we're going in. I know you're not going in because when you go out, that's what reveals what's in. And if it was in, when you went out, it would still be in. And you would be the same way out there that you are in here. Stop putting on a show. Because if you're not in, you can be in the walls and still not be in the church. Whew, all right. Having a form of godliness, all right. And then forsaking the assembly as some do. Is that you? And then some people just say, well, I ain't getting nothing out of it. Whose fault is that? God is present and you're not getting anything out of it, all right? But he's given us community. He's given us sanctuary, praise God. He's given us a means of protecting ourselves against what the world is facing. And you get that in assembly. You get it in community. You all have personal relationships with Jesus. You have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. But you got to be in community to have koinonia and fellowship. There are certain things that come from this gathering you don't get by yourself. Because you're not that smart. You're not that anointed. You need what others have to offer. Praise God. So in Matthew 16 and 18, he says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that lets me know that you're in a protected place if you're what, actively, honestly enrolled or, or a member of the church, or you're in the church. Amen? All right. Uh, I want to skip. Okay. Okay. I talked about the predatory uh, world that we live in. And this is something, saints, the church resides in a predatory world. And I want you to understand this. As long as the world exists, God will have a church in the world. Until ultimately we're caught out of here, there's going to be a church. So look how he loves us. This was established way back, over 2,000 years ago. And he put this organization together to house sheep to feed sheep, to help sheep to mature so that sheep could go forth and not be afraid of the wolves they have to fight in the environment outside these walls. But come back and be refilled and be refreshed and get understanding of divine revelation. Know one another. Know who's speaking into your lives. He says, we're going to need that all through the generations of grace. As long as grace is there, the church will be here. You can't kick church out and survive. Amen. It's not going to happen for you. You're going to have to understand. Now, if you're a missionary, you're in a foreign country, somebody's still watching. You're still part of an organization. Somebody's still what? Speaking for you, watching for you, speaking into your life, sharing your testimonies. They're supporting you. you but you have to be a part of the church. You can't do this on your own. So listen to what a predator does. A predator is an organism that exists by preying on other organisms. And then I looked up the characteristics of a predator. Predators may actively search for prey, or they may sit and wait for its unsuspecting victim to come by. I'm going to get into that in just a minute. I will give you all of these first. Number two. When prey is detected, the predator accesses whether, assesses whether he should attack. Hmm, that looks juicy. <laughs> should I attack or should I leave it alone? All right. It might involve an ambush, it might involve a pursuit, it might involve stalking for a while. But it has strategies, all right? Then the third thing is that predators are adapted and often highly specialized for hunting. 
They adapt. They know they have the, the, the keen senses. You know, like they say, a dog can detect fear. You know, well, Satan can detect the lack of faith. He can detect a lot of stuff that you think you, you know, you got everybody fooled but him. All right. And the definition said that he's good at mimicking. He can make you appear to be himself, appear to be something he ain't. And because you don't have any sense of discernment, you just all up in his face thinking this is, it's got to sound down because it knows that's all you go by anyway. It can give you the right dance step and you get there and dance with them, but you don't know where the dance is coming from. It's good at mimicking. All right? So listen to what Saint, uh, Satan's, uh, Satan's last day adventure is the great falling away of many, many saints. He wants to see as, as many of us as he can get out of the, what, the safety of God as possible by pulling them, dividing, devouring community. Get them out there, scatter them. So I can, what, pluck them off one at a time. Faith, uh, uh, Peter says, but be vigilant because the devil, as a roaring lion, what does he do? He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The question is, does he have to hunt for you? Or does he just simply have to wait for you to come into his den? Because that's where you frequent. You go right up in there with it. And it don't feel no condemnation or nothing. You're just sitting there and all of that mess and stuff and junk. Praise God. When prey is detected, the predator assesses whether he should attack. He knows you. He knows if you are armed and dangerous <laughs> or if you are ignorant, praise God, of his devices. Something about and it's one thing when we were growing up, remember, you know, we talked about this before. You know, you had always had bullies in the neighborhood. They pick on certain folk. But if they knew you had family, they knew you had a big brother, they knew you had a daddy that didn't play that stuff, oh, big sister, they would approach you a little differently. But if they know you're just wandering out there all by yourself, that's what the devil is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says he's a member. He don't go to church. Sick it. You ain't fooling him. He, know, he saw you when you put that wine glass down. Saw you when you took, picked up whatever it is you should. Saw you when, when you went somewhere, did some things, or doing some things that is, should not be named amongst Christians. Sure, he's going to attack you. He's reeling you in, reeling you in. But see, if you come around here, you don't want to hear that kind of stuff because they're going to put you in check. And it will put you in check. No, I ain't nobody tell me what to do. You know, and then you what? You go somewhere else where well, that's acceptable. And they call that church too. All right. He knows if you're just faking or if you are deeply connected to the church. He knows if you are in community or if you're actually traveling down or living on Backslider Boulevard. He knows. He knows. So let's stop faking it. If we're going to be in church, let's be in church. Amen? Praise God. Now, saints, it's time to trim my lamps. It's time to strengthen that which remains. It's time to be revived. Praise God. Now, I wanted to give you this little uh, test, okay? And uh, as I read these scriptures, I want you to identify David's heart concerning what he's saying. And I want you to compare what David is saying to how you feel about it. Don't give me a pat answer. Don't respond in the way that makes you look holy or religious. I want you to be honest. I want you to be truthful with yourself, all right? So we come to Psalms, the 26th chapter and the 8th verse. And this is what David says. He says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. And the place where thine honor dwelleth. The question is, do you love God's house or do you just tolerate it? Mm. Do I love God's house? 
Maybe I love God's house, I just don't love this house. Do I love God's house? Do I come to God's house because I really need what the house has to offer? Or is it just out of habit, just out of tradition, just to appear to be faithful? See, anything other than actually loving it won't work. Psalms 27 and 4. Let's see what David says here. One thing have I despised, a desired, I'm sorry, of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Father, your presence is so awesome. I really don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be in the house of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What was David talking about? Jesus. All the days? I'll give you an hour and a half. Next week. David, what type of relationship? What kind of fellowship, what kind of communion was going on with you and God? All the days. All right. Psalms 84 and 10. For a day in the courts, in thy courts, is better than a thousand days somewhere else. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I think what we have to identify here is that we're talking about someone that actually had relationship with God. And they loved each other. And being in his presence, what his presence brought to that relationship. Then Psalms 122 and 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Ah, were you glad about it? When your clock went off this morning, Hallelujah. you woke up into a spirit of drudgery. Oh, I got to get up. I got to get dressed. Got to figure out what I'm going to wear. Got to drive. Got to fight this traffic. Got to get over there. Praise God. Oh, I don't know if I want to do this today. Hallelujah. My week has been bad. I don't like what the news I got on my job. I, I just need to sit here and turn on TV. Let me tell you something. If your week was that bad, the one place you need to be, whoo, ah, the devil and I tell you, we went nine rounds. Whoo, Jesus. And I was almost depleted, but God, I need to get in your presence. And I don't need to do it just by myself. I need what the other saints have to offer. Lord, I'm waking up. I couldn't wait to get to church. Why I need you to bring me, usher me into the presence of the Lord. Sing the songs God has anointed you to sing. My soul is deplenished. I need to be built. Strengthen me in the name of Jesus. Speak the word of God. (laughs) Feed my soul. Help me, Father. I'm sitting here like a sponge, waiting to receive. Why do I have that attitude? Because God, I know my battle isn't over, and I got to go right back out there. Tomorrow, Monday morning, the, the, the job calls again, and I got to face all these heathens. Give me something to say. I want to bring the right presence. Jesus. Help me, God. I'm a light to this lost and dying world. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet.